Welcome to The View from the Top with Brian Friedman, brought to you by Benevo. We offer digital products for top companies to help their employees relocate and settle into a new city. In this series, you'll hear stories, advice, insights, and thoughts on the future from leaders in HR and the talent mobility profession. As a listener, you also get a fantastic deal. That's 20 registrations, free of charge, worth £10,000 when you launch with our starter plan. To claim, go to benevo.com and enter the code PODCAST2018 in the special offer field on our contact page. Hello, and welcome to The View from the Top, the podcast brought to you by Benevo. My name is Brian Friedman, and I'm the strategy director of Benevo, the world's leading welcome as a service mobility tech company. My guest today is Bill Grable, the chairman and chief executive of Grable, the world's largest privately owned relocation company. Grable is very much a family business. It was started back in 1950 by Dave Grable, Bill's dad. And initially it was just a small local moving company in Warsaw. That's Warsaw, Wisconsin, not Warsaw in Poland. And that small local moving company prospered as a national van line. Bill himself joined the company in 1975, which by my reckoning is some 43 years ago. And at that time, Grable was still purely a domestic operation. Things changed in 1981 when Grable moved into international movings and changed even more in 2000 when they started moving away from moving services and moved into their international relocation and assignment management services arm. But the most radical move of all was in 2014 when Grable sold its US van line in order to focus exclusively on global talent mobility and workforce retention services. So Bill, welcome to The View from the Top and congratulations on your impressive achievements and how you've steered Grable from a small local moving company in Wisconsin to a major player in the global relocation industry. Bill, welcome to The View from the Top. Well, thank you, Brian. It's an honor to be here and uh, I look forward to our chat today. Great. So, So Bill, in my introduction, I've said a little bit about the company and its origins and how it developed from being a small local moving company to the relocation giant that it is today. But can you just tell us a little bit about the company, a little bit of maybe about the number of moves you do, the span of operations, the number of employees you have, a little bit of a background to the company. And in particular, actually, I'd be quite interested to learn more about that move from being a van line to being the relocation giant you are today. Oh, very good. Uh, You know, currently, Brian, we have about 800 employees uh, throughout the world in uh, 12 different locations, three of them uh, in Europe, uh, that being London, Prague in the Czech Republic and Ireland, and then in uh, Asia Pacific in Singapore and Shanghai, and then uh, a variety of other offices in the U.S. Uh, Denver is our headquarters, Atlanta, Houston, Phoenix, Seattle. New York, uh, and so forth. So uh, with that footprint, uh, this year, I guess, we'll manage somewhere in the range of 65, 70,000 uh, relocations that at uh, one point or another will touch uh, any of 165 countries. So uh, no doubt there's, there's quite a bit of global scope to the organization. One of the things I really love is, is uh, frankly, learning how to be a better global employer. Um, You know, we knit so many uh, people of diverse backgrounds uh, together as a team in each of our locations. And, uh, you know, the learnings of uh, understanding the the various cultures and work norms and uh, what motivates and um, inspires people from different regions of the world has uh, has truly been a uh, a blessing beyond what could have ever been imagined uh, when we kind of began our journey to go from being a national company to then an international company and then a, a global company. Um, part of your question there, Brian, related to uh, touching on you know the 
underlying basis of our moving from uh, being both a, a, a removals or a household good moving company and a relocation management company to exclusively focusing on mobility. And, uh, you know, really in some ways it, it's one of those stories of what got you here won't get you there. And, uh, you know, the speed of business today, the rate of the uh, evolving technology, um, the, the simple fact that, you know, two very different uh, industries, although very keenly linked. So what I mean by that, you know, the moving industry is uh, very much focused on, you know, hard assets such as warehouses and trucks and then, uh, you know, quite a bit of labor um, that then is, is deployed and goes to people's homes and, and so forth. Uh, conversely, the mobility management side of the organization uh, is very much a you know, a, a somewhat technology driven, uh, you know, uh, higher education levels generally needed. Um, and so the, the, the people needs, the, the infrastructure needs, uh, even the, the business models uh, between those two industry segments, um, quite different. And, uh, and we came to the conclusion that, you know, the, the objective is always, you know, to try to be the best in your niche, try to be the best um, and, and differentiated in the value that you create for your clients. And uh, in a sense, we, we came to the conclusion that we really couldn't be the best in both simultaneously, the, the speed of change, the, the reach of our organization. Um, you know, we just, we felt that uh, strategically the right thing to do was to uh, kind of pick a lane and then having picked that lane, uh, then focus on becoming the best in that particular segment. So, um, you know, we've kind of done that. It, it's certainly enabled us to uh, expand geographically and, and globally at a faster rate. It's enabled us to uh, concentrate our investments in technology and uh, more importantly, really to kind of double down on our um, strategy of being an employer of choice. And uh, so here we are, we're, yeah, we're well, still a we'll uh, work in progress, but uh, it's been a wonderful journey. Well, congratulations, congratulations on that. I mean, they say that young startup companies have to learn how to pivot from going in one direction to another. But here's a company that's been going since 1950. Uh, and in fact, you've pivoted 180 degrees away from, from your heritage of being a van line. Um, having gone global on the van line, you've then gone out of the market and into the, the relocation management market. It must have been quite emotional for you and the family s saying goodbye to, if you like, the, the moving heritage that, that you had. Oh, no question. Uh, and it would be for anybody that, you know, has a family business and it's a service industry and, you know, the essence of service industry is really employee engagement uh, because every day those folks have to go out and, you know, work on behalf of the best interests of, of the people they're serving. And uh, so you, you certainly pour a lot of um, time and effort and, and, and engagement uh, into a workforce. And uh, yet, you know, the, uh, I guess as we look forward here, the company has transformed many times over the years, Brian. Not a lot of folks uh, uh, maybe recognize that, but uh, we're in the iteration of the company that we call Grable V.5, which is to infer that we've kind of had five, um, you know, uh, focal points in the organization over these, these 60 some odd years. And uh, what's really fascinating is each iteration has had a half-life of its predecessor. So, you know, Grable V.1 was, you know, as this kind of small local regional moving company and V.2 a national uh, company and V.3 starting to emerge as a, you know, an international mover and V.4 being uh, where we, you know, uh, expanded into the relocation management industry and, and V.5 uh, when we really kind of set our eyes on being a global uh, provider and not just a U.S.-based international provider. And where we really find ourselves today is almost like in a stage that I would call uh, launching into Grable 2.0. So all of those iterations, V.1, V.2, 3, 4, and 5, 
we're in the context of kind of Grable 1.0. Um, and now we're kind of moving into an environment that, I, as I mentioned, references Grable 2.0. And uh, what that really means is, you know, the, the, the recasting of Grable as a digital company, the recasting of Grable uh, as a, certainly a global company and a global employer and uh, supporting the needs of, of uh, major multinational companies from whatever their country of origin is. And, and that's a um, kind of a new horizon that is really exciting for us. Uh, we'll certainly take a lot of the values and virtue of um, what got us here, but uh, going forward, we're very confident that we can kind of continue to extrapolate those, but in in kind of a new economy context uh, that hopefully brings, you know, ever greater strategic value uh, to our clients, but as well to the company itself. Okay. Well, tell me a little bit, we've talked a bit about the company, but let's talk about about Bill Grable rather than Grable the company for a moment. Tell us about how you got there. I mean, what was your career route? I know you started in 1975. I'm not sure if that was straight out of school or whether you'd worked somewhere before, but a little bit about how you moved up, albeit within a family business, but how you moved up within the organization. <laughs> sure. Oh, Brian, gosh, I actually started uh, in 1968, but, you know, we keep that under the radar because child labor laws uh, wouldn't <laughs> provide full well. disclosure. But, you know, my mom allowed me when I was seven years old to finally ride the bike uh, about a mile and a half over to the warehouse so I could uh, just hang around with the guys. And, you know, my first jobs were really sweeping the floor and stacking pack material and, and washing trucks and things like that. So, um, you know, as I got into high school age and, and college, I was actually a mover in uh, going out into people's residences and, a you know, a semi-tractor trailer driver. And uh, all of those were, you know, fantastic experiences. And of course, you know, the, the scale of the company and, and the uh, the responsibilities and and so forth were were much simpler uh, back in those days. But um, after graduating college, we had uh, just a few months prior opened a uh, a location in Denver, Colorado, and uh, and I went to university down in Colorado Springs, which is about an hour away. And uh, it just seemed you know totally normal and totally native uh, for me to. Then since we had a new uh, location and it was, you know, in close proximity to where I was going to school, came up there and, and uh, so kind of on the ground floor helped establish, um, you know, our operation in, in Denver and uh, a few years after that kind of came over to the corporate side of the company um, and, uh, you know, eventually moved up in the ranks to becoming the president of our, our moving operations and then you know, chief operating officer, and and then uh, oh, about 14 years ago now, I guess, um, became the CEO, and uh, just about a year ago, uh, also added the title of chairman. And uh, I have to tell you that, uh, in and of itself, you know, being a second generation person, uh, you know, I stand in the shadow of a giant, a great entrepreneur, and and uh, business leader, and and you know, employer in, in, in my father. And uh, the passing of the baton of uh, chairman was a very interesting process in, in many regards. Um, you know, we're super fortunate in that a lot of times the, the passing of the baton in a family business occurs uh, over a casket or in, in some cases in a courtroom. Um, and we had a very well orchestrated succession plan over a period of a couple of years. And, uh, you know, frankly, it was a really beautiful thing. And when you talk about the emotion of uh, various phases or iterations of the company, um, you know, that one was just really sweet and fantastic and beyond whatever could be imagined. Um, but okay. I'm, I normally ask the question, who inspired you in your career and what did they, they teach you? Um, I'm guessing that from what you just said, one of the people that inspired you during your career was in fact your, your dad, who you obviously worked with very closely for many years. But tell us a little bit about who, who inspired you and, and what it was that, that those people taught you. Well, most definitely, you know, my dad, just because of the, uh, oh, 
certainly the effort applied, but then, you know, the amazing lens that he put on uh, the opportunity of serving customers and, and you know, constantly finding ways to uh, be innovative and, and create new levels of value that differentiated the company and then how you had to work internally as an employer uh, to really make sure you had everybody on the same page and that your your mission and vision and values were aligned. So um, no question in terms of getting into this seat, <laughs> if you will, um, he was a great, you know, mentor and, and role model. But aside from that, you know, uh, this, this may sound different, but you know, being in the homes of people for so many years, the transferees have actually inspired me because, you know, you realize you're dealing with these people at a very vulnerable point in their certainly career, um, but as well in their lives. You know, the, the relocation process is, is disruptive. It, it certainly can have good connotations to it, but nevertheless, there's a bit of a, a burden that goes along uh, with the simple you know, necessities of picking up and going from one home to another home. And then if that crosses time zones and countries and, and everything else. Uh, so the insights that you gain working with individuals and, and, you know, as they're going through their various phases of life and, and the different companies or industries that they're a part of, um, you know, I guess it really, for me, it brought a very human centric lens to the responsibility and trust that people are placing in us. And uh, with that kind of accountability, um, you know, comes a certain uh, clarity of, of mission. And uh, so, you know, there's not any one transferee per se, but it's a montage of, of serving different people at different points in time in their lives and uh, with different underlying, you know, uh, uh, reasons that they're they're relocating and uh, it just is it's been wonderful to uh, to be able to be in a capacity to help people when they're in that uh, uh, stage of life or in, in that particular situation and uh, when it's all said and done you know kind of delivering joy I mean that's really the major outcome that that you're aiming for um, delivering you know, joy I love that that's a great one for a movie yeah you know, I mean, most people don't have that expectation associated with relocating. You know, they just want to generally endure it and, and come out the other side and be reasonably settled and, and get focused on their work. Um, so, you know, if you look beyond just fulfilling those basic needs and say, well, how could we really make this special? Uh, yeah, the reaction is one of joy. That's, that's wonderful. And in terms of the, the next generation, if you had some rookie young graduates in your in your office what lessons would you pass on to those those people what advice would you give those people who are just literally starting out now in in this industry yeah well i think it applies pretty much to anybody that's walking the planet these days and, and uh first of all you got to commit to being a lifelong learner uh you know whether it's you know technology or just you know the the, the society we live in today uh, is is moving so quickly and and you know various norms are changing or being challenged and um, uh, for the most part you know you want to be in control of of your life and that says you know to identify and lock in on a purpose um, and, and a lot of folks don't take the time to to define for themselves what is their purpose um, so it, that's really where I would start. And then uh, having defined a purpose, then be you know, committed and, and be a lifelong learner in terms of how you can um, you know, excel or otherwise uh, contribute in, in ever more valuable ways and, and reaching and touching um, and benefiting you know, a, a wider array of people or, or circumstances. Um, you know, the bottom line is this industry is really a caregiver industry. It's not much different than healthcare uh, in the way, again, that people come to you in a time of need. Um, they're relatively vulnerable at that time, and there's an extraordinary amount of trust um, that they're implicitly placing in the, in the relationship uh, that, that is really uh, a function of your introduction to them. And so uh, having this notion of, of being a caregiver and, and having empathy 
um, and accountability, um, you know, are just cornerstones for success in this industry. And if you don't have that, um, you know, the workday is going to be a battle uh, because it basically means when you sit down and, and, you know, you start your work, if you're not wired to be a caregiver, but you're expected to be compassionate and you're expected to be accountable and you're expected to be, you know, somewhat urgent on the behalf of others, um, you know, folks are going to have a lot of stress doing that when they're not wired that way. So, again, it kind of comes back to, you know, knowing what your purpose is, knowing um, what brings you fulfillment in, in your day. Um, so many people, you know, they have a job and they can, they can do a good job, they can do a bad job, they can be late for their job. Um, but what you really want to, to identify in yourself and then as you become a leader in an organization is, is make sure that there is clarity of purpose and that people are, are, are natively wired uh, to fulfill that purpose. Okay, so we've talked a little bit now about, about you know, the company and about your, your, your route into the company and things you've seen and the advice you give. I'd like to start looking towards the future, if I may. Let's just start off with the near future and then maybe we'll move a bit more into the distant future. What are your, you know, what's top of your intro? What are your top three objectives for the next 12 to 18 months? Uh, good question. You know, uh, as you can probably tell, a, a big focus um, for me is making sure that we are an employer of choice and, uh, and that the, the mission and, and vision and values of our, our company um, are, are clearly embraced uh, around this notion of a duty of care. And so, um, if you will, that, that notion of being an employer of choice in you know, multiple geographies around the world, uh, generally now with full employment economies everywhere, and then, you know, kind of seeking a gene in people that is uh, directly, you know, focused on helping and serving others, it really narrows down uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the potential number of people that would be good fits uh, in your organization. And, uh, so that kind of circles right back around is, is somehow the notion of, hey, if I'm wired this way, this seems like a company where I would want to work uh, is a big part of my mission and focus. And, you know, that has to resonate whether in Singapore, that has to resonate in Shanghai, it has to resonate in a variety of markets here in the U.S. or in Europe. And they all have a little different, uh, I don't know, nuance to them, I guess you would say. But at the core, there are, are certain values that, um, you know, really are, are tangible and, and uh, uh, relevant in, in each of those different markets or cultures. So definitely number one is, you know, the focus on employer of choice and its um, extension of, of delivering on a duty of care. Um, the second really has to do with this marvelous landscape of technology. And oh my gosh, there are so many different applications to, uh, you know, benefit the transferee experience. There are so many opportunities to uh, leverage the uh, underlying data and, and knowledge uh, that, that sits in systems from a program management point of view. And of course, going forward, applying things like artificial intelligence or, you know, even leveraging things like robotics, um, you know, in terms of, oh, uh, just routine, processes, if you will, um, you know, and how much value creation can you, can you create for the company in, in reduction of errors or increases of cycle time? And, um, and most importantly, like what kind of knowledge can you harvest out of uh, the client's program that may not have been previously perceptible by a human that now through, you know, the analysis of, of all sorts of data sets, you can bring into a, a, a client and, and help be a strategic lever for growth in their own organization. Um, so, you know, determining su success factors of, you know, what types of transferees from what origins, with what educational backgrounds, with what uh, policies they were, they were relocated uh, with, you know, uh, are these folks performing better than the local population? Are they meeting the expectations? Is it equipping them better for 
uh, succession planning inside their own organization. You know, they're just vast fields of, of uh, you could say opportunity on the one hand, but understanding on the other that when applied uh, can really bring some significant value to every stakeholder uh, involved. You know, the transferees benefit, the, the program manager benefits, and, and ultimately the shareholders of the uh, corporation benefit. And then I guess I would say finally, you know, the, the shape of the global workforce today is, is so um, diverse and it's self-transforming. You know, you hear a lot about the gig workers or uh, millennials. I mean, there's all sorts of labels out there. Um, but, you know, the intersection of like, you know, extended business travelers versus short-term assignees or commuters, um, you know, this is where, again, some of the, the knowledge that maybe you can mine out of your systems to bring better business intelligence to the customer um, will be impactful in, um, again, kind of segmenting and applying the right kind of policies for the, um, you know, right subsets of the workforce so that uh, when it's all said and done, the uh, the outcome of speed and efficiency um, and ease is is manifested across every one of those different kinds of transferee types in a way that previously has not been, um, you know, whatever, available or evident. Um, uh, so it's kind of exciting, actually. You know, we're living in a period of, of history, I think. You know, the uh, the world will look back on these years, you know, from the great uh, global financial crisis moving forward and say, holy smokes, uh, that was a very transformative time in human history. And and we get the good fortune of, of living in these times and uh, uh, having the opportunity to really create, um, well, whatever, new dimensions of, of, of value and, and uh positive experiences for people on an ever wider global stage. Well, let's and take that further. Let's drill down into that. Um, and you've talked about, you know, three things there, I think, really, employer choice, technology, and the whole changes to the, the, the workforce, the structure of the workforce. But let's go forward, say, 10 years, 15 years. Um, talk me through your vision of what the the company or indeed the moving experience will look like with the benefit of all this, assume that all this technology that we dream about is in place, we're there. What do you think it will look like in 10 to 15, 20 years time? Well, uh, gosh, you know, this is just one person's opinion, but um, there are a few things that'll never change, right? I mean, the people and, and their possessions are physical objects. So obviously those have to move through time and space. I don't think there's a whole lot you can do in terms of, you know, accelerating uh, the speed in which uh, folks or their possessions can, can physically move. You know, maybe there's supersonic air transport, but I don't think the trucks are gonna necessarily get faster. The ships are necessarily gonna get faster. Um, I don't think you're going to be able to, you know, like Star Trek transport people. Um, so those, those things don't change. So it's, it's on the, you know, the periphery of those kind of physical realities that, uh, oh gosh, I, I think the customer experience uh, certainly is going to be uh, completely digitized in the sense of the gathering of the information and, you know, the execution of forms and the applications and, and things like that all kind of on a device you put in your pocket or, I don't know, maybe there's some little, you know, panel that, that, that you hold on to. I can't imagine, you know, the minimization of devices um, being exponentially uh, greater than they already are. It's amazing the, the horsepower that, uh, you know, you have in your pocket and the, the access to information and your ability to transact already today. But, uh, you know, in, in, in some ways, the, the engines underneath all of those um, tools, you know, are probably themselves faster and, uh, gosh, more robust. Um, you know, I think it's really the, the big changes out there, Brian, are going to be... Um, and I do think there's going to be ever more mobility in this world. There's, uh, you know, human migration for whatever reason. 
uh, is there's going to be more of it than there ever has been in in history. Um, and I, was, I, was, I was going to drill down on that with you, actually. Let me, let me just challenge you on that. And okay. I, I've asked that question of a few people, and I'm getting two different schools of thought. So it'd be interesting to see where you fall, you fall on that one. Is that one school of thought says mobility is ever increasing. It always has been. Uh, people like to move and they will carry on moving. And increasing globalization means that more and more people will move and and that's just how life is it's always increased it will carry on increasing another school of thought says well that used to be the case but actually now what we're seeing is more virtual working uh people working from home not having to go to the office more people may be able to work through uh, uh video uh, skype or zoom or what have you um are working that way uh, and also an increasing amount of protectionism from various economies around the world uh, including both the US and the UK of a feeling where actually there should be limits on uh, on easy movement across cross borders so as I said there's one school of thought that says mobility will always continue another school of thought saying well actually maybe things like politics and uh, technology are combining to actually make mobility less than it used to be. So where, where would you be on, on in that argument? Uh, well, I'm on the side of the argument that says there will be more mobility for um, a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is that, you know, I, I think globalization is here to stay. Um, and what does that mean? That means, you know, an individual's ability to access goods or services uh, created anywhere on the planet will be easier, cheaper, and faster than it ever was before. And, uh, and so in the context of commerce, you know, commerce is like water, and, and commerce will flow through the paths of least resistance. Um, and so, you know, assuming basically what that's saying is if there is continuous rising global GDP, and if there are places that, whether political or artificial barriers are, are erected, um, you know, the world isn't going to stop being a consumer and, and the world isn't going to stop being a producer. Uh, so that commerce is going to continue to flow. So that's, that's one part of, I think, the underlying driver, um, because we're sitting in an environment today where the... Um, you know, the, the employment markets are pretty much at uh, full employment in, in the vast majority of places around the world. And so, you know, by and large, there's always going to be some level of skills shortage, um, you know, to varying degrees in, in a variety of places uh, throughout the world. And so that's the essence of mobility is, is getting the right people in the right seats in the right places at the right time. Um, so, you know, if, if nothing else, I think, you know, projecting out five, ten years, uh, you're very likely to see the need for mobility to be ever more strategically utilized and leveraged just for the, the reason that, you know, the skills and the talent are necessary in, in moments in time where generally there are very tight labor markets. Um, the third reason I think there's going to be continuous uh, increasing levels of mobility is that you know, it, it, it's probably true societally for the U.S. or Europe, uh, you know, mature um, Western economies, you know, the, um, I guess you would say almost the, the evolutionary scale of, of human existence, human experience uh, is such where maybe the notion of relocating isn't as attractive as it was in the past. But, you know, there's still another five billion other people on the planet that don't live in Europe or live in the United States that uh, are going to be motivated to uh, better their their personal circumstance and uh, and and be open and available to do that through uh, relocating from wherever it is that they're from so you know, in some regards, yeah, maybe there's a point of maturity or saturation in the mobility quotient of the average European or American. Uh, but I don't think that quotient is anywhere near tapped 
in terms of the receptiveness or the desirability of mobility for folks uh, in, in the other, you know, countries and regions of the world. So, uh, you know, that's, I guess, the basis of my outlook of saying I, it, it's certainly going to be different and, and the transferees may be of uh, a far more diverse uh, segment of the population, but uh, I think there's a very robust outlook for uh, mobility as a growth industry over the course of the next frankly, generation or two. Well, that's probably good enough for both of us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that'll see us soon. Now, tell, tell me, Bill, we're, we're nearly running out of time, but um, I did want to ask you one question. Um, when I talk to and do these interviews with some of the, the corporates, I tend to ask them, what makes a great service provider? I'd like to ask you, the question really the other way around from a vendor perspective what from your point of view makes a really great client oh golly uh top of mind there's probably three things um uh first of all if there is clarity of mission and vision in the client organization in terms of what are the objectives of the mobility program and you know sometimes that isn't as clearly understood, you know, whether it's the, the folks out in the business units that are the recipient of the service that the mobility managers uh, are orchestrating and delivering on their behalf. Uh, sometimes that's not, um, you know, as clear of a mission in the procurement stakeholders or the, the finance stakeholders realizing that, you know, this is a very, if you will, delicate service. It's not like buying you know, iron ore or corn where, you know, there's a commoditized uh, lens and pricing and those sorts of things on it. Um, so uh, coming back full circle, uh, it's, it's certainly uh, clients who have, you know, kind of a clear understanding with regard to the mission and vision and, and expectations of what are the deliverables um, that are, are really to be uh, you know, the center of the bullseye and, and if the clarity of objectives are, are there, uh, it makes everyone a winner. You know, the, certainly the client, uh, program manager, the business unit people are happy, the transferees are happy and the employees and suppliers that are supporting that client are, are happy because there's a sense of fulfillment and there's a sense of, uh, success, um, in the program. The, the second would be um, the notion of mutuality. Uh, you know, what I mean by that. Um, there's a lot of um, me first attitudes uh, in life and in business. And uh, companies that realize that, you know, uh, basically there, there's two styles of clients out there one that are going to constantly be in the marketplace looking and searching for and churning vendors. Uh, and, and there are others that are looking to, to really develop partnerships and, uh, and the value of the partnerships is the overall um, synergy and efficiency gained uh, in, in the reduction of wasted motion of, uh, you know, gosh, uh, implementing complex programs and, uh, so the notion of mutuality that, you know, there is a, a, a give and a take in the relationship, um, that there is kind of a, a notion of being journey partners because, you know, as, as programs evolve, as the labor force changes, uh, all of this is, is like kind of uncharted territory. And, uh, and so, you know, it takes all of us really to leverage our collective knowledge and our collective resources uh, and, and focus them on, you know, the, the primary objectives of serving people really well and harvesting accurate information uh, out of the programs and ensuring compliance in every regard and, you know, security and, and uh, you know, ensuring it's clean commerce, if you will, across the entire spectrum. Uh, and the third is, you know, people that uh, what, what make a good client are, are people who love doing this, uh, uh, 
you know, profession. Um, not everybody who is a mobility manager, frankly, loves serving others. <laughs> and uh, and so uh, if, if you can find at a client, uh, somebody who does have the caregiver gene, somebody who is uh, intrigued about, um, you know, what is the human impact on the folks that they're uh, mobilizing and, and relocating. And uh, in the context of doing that, uh, you know, again, are, are uh, you know, they're kind of inquisitive and they're engaged and, uh, and, and fascinated uh, on a very human level uh, how to best support uh, the people that are actually going through the process. Um, so those would be, I guess, the three things that, uh, for me, would identify uh, an ideal client, if you will. Those are fascinating insights. Bill, I'm afraid we're now pretty much all out of time. So all that remains for me to do is to thank you very much for taking part in The View from the Top, our podcast by Benevo, and also to thank all our listeners um, for, uh, for listening to today's podcast. So, Bill, thank you very much for being, uh, for being such a support and taking part. Well, my pleasure, Brian. I'm honored that uh, uh, you reached out to me and I wish you and your team all the best going forward and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care. For more episodes, you can subscribe at Benevo.com. And remember, you can also claim our special offer worth £10,000. That's 20 additional registrations free of charge with our starter plan. Simply go to Benevo.com and enter podcast 2018 in the special offer field on the contact page. We hope you've enjoyed listening to this episode of The View from the Top.